Well, hello and welcome to 15 Minute Theology, a podcast covering the central truths in the Christian faith in, yeah, let's call it 15, about 15 minutes. My name is Tyler Burton, and in this episode, we're talking about God's relationship to time, namely what theologians call his eternality. It's a big idea, kind of a funky idea when we start to think about it, but helping me out today is somebody more than up to the task about talking through something just like this. Justin Bailey is an editor at Oxford University Press, fellow church member at Imago Day Church, and expectant father of four, currently father of three, and in the go. coming weeks, father of four. So zone defense is on is on game, figuring out the kiddos, and then just throw a fourth one in there. Why not, right? Yeah, yeah, and you want to be clear, it's, it's ex- already have three with one to make four, not four all at one time. That would be... Um... Yeah, I, I probably wouldn't be doing this if that, that was about to happen. <laughs> that would be madness. Yeah. How do you say like expecting fourth kid? Is that the better way to say expectant father well, I, or fourth? Yeah, I guess. I, you know? You know, I, I, I Honestly, I just don't tell people at this point. It's just like, yeah, they'll, they'll figure it out. <laughs> but yeah, we have kids. They're, they're those ones over there. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. That's right. Man. Well, Justin, thanks for joining me, man. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's going to be fun. It sure is, man. So let's get the fun started. Let's just get real quick, kind of a, a kickoff definition. When we say God is eternal, when we're speaking about his relationship to time, what do we mean? What do we mean when we say that God is eternal? Yeah. So I think historically, right, the easiest way to understand this is probably it's God's independence and his immutability. And it's just like it's fleshed out and applied to time specifically. Right. And that's that's kind of what you want to really key it on because if you apply it to other things, we get other attributes, but it's, it's those things applied to time. And that becomes somewhat of a difficult concept, right? When you start to think about it specifically, just because time tends to be difficult, right? Paraphrasing Augustine, right? I, I know how to explain time until I have to explain time, right? But I do think it's, it's, we understand it, right? When we talk about time, like we, we understand what that is. I was, as I was kind of doing this, I was reading uh, Charles Octavius Booth was getting into this a little bit and he has a, it's a really good quote when he talks about, he says, here again, we mortal worms come up to the brink and look into the deep mystery to see nothing but mystery. Right. And <laughs> that seems to be kind of a, a normal thing we can expect when we talk about attributes of God. But yeah, it, all it is, is really it's eternality with time is this idea of, so what is time, right? It's like, for us, it's, it's internal and it's an external, right? So when we think about time, it's like these things that are happening to us, but time in and of itself is, is by nature creature like creaturely right mm. it's it, it it's good. start yeah. begins with creatures it, it, it begins with creation it's 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 not something of god necessarily um but it begins there and so when we're talking about it we can kind of understand it right like i can understand time in the sense of like time on my clock time on my watch right the earth revolves around the sun you know or however we're, we're talking about it um and even then we can get a little bit more into kind of abstract like most people understand at least to the basic extent, like Einstein's theory of relativity, that time, depending on where you are, changes depending on how fast and things like that. So it can kind of be malleable. And so like when we talk about time, like we can kind of understand that. And then we also understand like internally time, we can say something happened in the past, something's going to happen in the future. Something has happening to me now. And it's this experiential moments, these sequences that are happening. So as we're talking about eternality, especially when we're talking about God, like these are the things that we want to kind of keep in mind of that. And when we start thinking about that, like one of those is real, like, I think easy to think of God not existing in, right? So like external time, like I can understand that God isn't like, you know, what time is it? You know, like mm. looking yeah, at a watch, no, looking, like looking at stars or like the constellations or things like that. The one right. that I think is a little more difficult to wrap our minds around is like God ex- existing outside of like intrinsic time and this mm. internal thing of like not experiencing past, presence, and future in different manners. Mm. Um, and so I think that's kind of as we start to delve into that, where it becomes more like mind blowing might, might be the right word. I, I don't know if that's, <laughs> that's the best way to say it. It just becomes a little more difficult, right? As you start to parse through those things, but it's like this logical understanding of, who God is in his independence of things and in his immutability where he doesn't change. And how does that, how is that affected by what we understand as time? Um, Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's that's the basic gist of kind of what we're doing with that. Yeah. So his, his relationship to time is that he 
is free from change to, I like the difference between internal and external, right? External time. Mm -hmm. I love how you said it. We can kind of get our heads around that. God doesn't need a clock. Doesn't need a watch. Okay. I'm, I'm kind of there, right? Like that, that kind of makes sense. The internal experience though, is where it feels like what Booth said, right? Like we're looking over into the abyss and we're like, I don't yeah. fully understand how this is going on. Yeah. Um, by the way, you you immediately said the Augustine quote, which was just in my head as you were talking. As like, that's my favorite quote, uh, probably one of my favorite quotes from Augustine because I think he's on the money, right? Absolutely. So in God's in God's relationship to time, you immediately brought up that there is a creature creator distinction that is apparent right away in this discussion. Um, why is it a good thing? Why is it good news that there is such a <laughs> distinction? between God and us in our experiences of time. Yeah. So I think, I think there's a few reasons why I think in particular, like one of the things for why it's good that God, right. Exists outside of time. Right. And this idea that he is existing in this, this being this like, mode of eternality, whereas we have like a mode of uh, finitude, right? Like we have a beginning, we, we have a past, we have a present, we have a future, right? This idea that God is experiencing everything is present, right? E eternal present. And so nothing is like the successive moments, right? So mm. everything Very happens good. in front of yeah. him. Um, yeah. And it's really, it's, this is where it gets hard to kind of wrap our brains around. Like Aquinas has, has in the Summa, he has this understanding of it. Like I'm on a hill, like God is the guy, is the man on the hill who can see everybody walking, right? Mm. And like see kind of the, the curvatures of the earth and is, where people should go or maybe where there's danger or something's going on, but he can see it all. It's all happening before mm. him in time. Whereas we're, we're the, we're the guy on the Hill who can't see only, but what's in front of us, what's behind us, what's currently going on. So maybe we can see a little bit in front. Maybe we can see a little bit behind, or maybe this are, um, I think some Millard Erickson talks about like, it's, it's someone in like a, a church steeple watching a parade go by, right? They can see all the parade. They see everything going on. And so that gives us some, you know, analogies are analogies for a reason they don't they don't capture everything but it gives us some concept of this idea that because god is outside of time and he's experiencing everything at all that allows him to see everything right it, it's all happening before him there is no past there is no present there is no future there is just present right this is eternal yeah. kind of this eternal presence and so everything with that in front of him right is I don't, I don't know how we can say like, that's a bad thing in particular. Like yeah. we could probably say if we had no concept of what God does, right. If it's just, let's just think about God as like this, this actor, we could probably say it's neutral. Right. But the fact that God's eternality does not stop him from acting in time. It's very um, good. Yeah. Yeah. Is and then it's a, it's a good thing. And we see that specifically in, in various acts that God does, right? Through creation, through redemption, through these things that he's doing for his people. And obviously, mostly in the, in, not mostly, but very much in the incarnation. And so like, it, that is a thing where his difference, his knowledge, right? And I'm sure you'll get into this later or whenever you do that. But like his ability to do, be in this space also gives him his ability to know all these things and then his caringness and his kindness mm. that he acts in that on behalf of his people. Right. And that's, that is a good thing for us. That's very helpful because if, if God's eternality is like Aristotle's God, the, the unmoved mover who is unshaken by anything happening in front of him, he can't, he doesn't act. He doesn't choose to act in the world. Then God being that man on the hill is more like him being like in Bruce Almighty, the little kid on an anthill with a magnifying glass trying to like <laughs> shoot our legs off to watch a squirm, right? Like then right, if, right. if that's who God is, if Aristotle's God concept of God is correct, then God's eternality is not good news because he doesn't act within it because he doesn't move within it. But the fact that we have a God who is the first mover and is continually acting within our world, the fact that he has such an, a continually present presence in the midst of everything happening in time is a wonderfully good thing because it's this good God continually acting for the redemption of his people and his own glory. I, that's very helpful. Like that, I was a really helpful concept. So then if we kind of take that a little bit forward, we've already in this podcast talked about God's infinity. 
Mm-hmm. Um, infinity, eternality. Sometimes it's like, hold on, are we talking about the same thing here? Right. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, and that's the hard part about the attributes. They all kind of blend together sometimes. Briefly, how how would you say kind of eternality and infinity differ from one another? Yeah. So I think so. Historically, this idea of like um, you have independence of God, which then is like his immutability, and these like these tiered systems where things are just kind of falling, right? Kind of like a waterfall, kind of hitting everything as it comes down. And infinity, divine infinity is kind of this big umbrella uh, statement that's saying this exists. And when it is applied to something, like if it's applied to time, we're looking at eternality. If it's applied to space, we're looking at omnipresence, right? And so it's like these things, good. when these things are applied, I like Bob Inc.'s point is that it's it's an unhelpful, vague term. <laughs> um, and so he just kind of ignores it. I love it. Bob Inc. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But so it, much, this man. idea that when we apply this idea, this to something specific, it gives us a much more um, representative uh, attribute of God. So when it's applied to time, we're talking about eternity. When it's applied to spa- space, we're talking about omnipresence. And I think that's a real helpful way for a lot of people. Because I think even even if we don't fully grasp omnipresence, like I think that's a little more, it's a little more like um, concrete, yeah. like a definition than when we yeah. say eternity. Because we we tend to use eternity and like this idea of like, we're, we'll spend eternity with with God or eternity it's with Jesus good. in heaven. And like, there's this very, like, we have this concept of eternity. But we don't mm-hmm. think of, we think we still think of it as a very temporal thing because mm-hmm. again, we're creatures, right? <laughs> like, time That's how we can see it. That's who yeah. we are, right? Yeah. We have a beginning. Um, it's, we, we, we can't step outside of that necessarily. Um, not necessarily. We can't, right? We're creatures. We'll always be creatures. So when we talk about eternity, we have like this temporal understanding of it, which is good because there is this like, there's this, they work together, right? They're connected to, to, to this point, but that, I think that hurts us when we're actually talking about what is a, an eternal God? Like, what does that actually mean? Like, I think we get yeah. some, some of our terms just a little, a little mixed up when that happens. Yeah. Yet another example of our finitude, right? That even mm-hmm. our language fails us oh, uh, of sure. trying to describe these things. Yeah. Um, so then I loved the analogy from Aquinas you just brought up of he's the man on the hill seeing everything and yet the christian faith holds that there was a time when he descended from the hill right that that god became man to exist within time to willingly embrace the constraints of time and so i'm curious how we can see god's eternality helping us understand the incarnation person and work of jesus can you flesh that out for us a little bit yeah i think I think the incarnation is, it's the thing that just breaks everything, right? To, to, to yeah. not like in a bad yeah. way, right? It's just in like, the best way. Yeah. Right. When you start taking these things and you're saying this transcendent God who exists in a way that we, we can't fully comprehend, right? That's, that's the whole point of the mystery, right? The mystery of God of the Godhead then condescends in the second person of the Trinity to take on human form and historic christian belief it right he's fully god fully man right and like seeing these things come together like how does that work and we we see we see jesus in in the new testament still make these statements like i think the clearest one we always look at it as like oh he's claiming his divinity which is what he's doing but the i am statements in john Mm -hmm. right like that's that call back to the exodus when god is to reveal who he is by name right and he gives i am right i am who i am right this idea that i I am. It's it's present, right? Like <laughs> that's the whole point. That is oh, a present yeah. tense. Like I'm existing. I just exist. I I, I am, right? And so Jesus is making that claim to obviously connect himself to his divinity, but still reveal something about himself as as a as a member of the Godhead. Uh, and so we get this transcendent God who is incomprehensible. Like to to like we can understand him and he's knowable, right? But at the same time, like these things are you sit on this too long, your brain's just going to go to mush. Right. Um, if we're being honest. And so we, but we get him in human form and he condescends. And not only you get him in human form, we see constantly, right. We get him being human in the sense of like, he is, he is there. He is eating. He is drinking. He is, he is weeping. He is, he's angry. He does all these things without sin, but he still does these things, hmm. right. He's tempted and he's tried. I think when we look at it that way and we say who he, when we have the big concept of eternality and then we say, 
And somehow still that transcendence comes down and lives among us as creatures. It brings that con that, that idea of transcendence in his nearness to us really home. And it brings home just, I think the love and care that God has for his people. When we understand how great and how, I mean, how other he actually is. And yet he still comes down and we see it, we see it in the old Testament. We see him interacting and coming down and speaking to his people, but clearly in the incarnation, he is among his people and he is the firstborn to then lead his people out as a, as now as a brother, um, that, that should lead us to a bunch of things, right? <laughs> like mm, that, that yeah. should lead us to, to right. a heart of a very specific worship and awe and, and love and, and devotion. So I think that's a clear like when we take something that's such a big doctrine that can be so almost unwieldy at times and say, okay, well, how does that affect us as Christians? I think that's a, that's a very clear way to see that through, through the, the life, the death, the resurrection, the work of Jesus. I love that. You, you just reminded me of my, my reading from the Psalms yesterday, Psalm 22, where it's, it's this clear Psalm of the suffering servant. He's my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But then it kind of swings at the end. And the way it swings at the end is I will tell of this amongst my brothers in the congregation. Mm -hmm. It's like, I, it's the, the Messiah, the suffering servant now saying, I'm going to bring my brothers into this. That's what you just brought in. He's not ashamed to now call us brothers, right? This, this God who exists outside of time now brings us into his the life of the trinity with him that we are now his family yep. with him um it's too beautiful um it's too perfect you know these things are too high for me i cannot attain it but it's exactly what it is so justin thank you man this has been a great conversation you did such a good job doing all these things these big convoluted things in such a good amount of time man so thank you for that um then thank you so much for joining us we'll go ahead and we will see you next time Thanks, Alex.